So good afternoon everybody and, uh, and welcome. Uh, I know I'm supposed to have a, a video, a two minute video, uh, but uh, Apple uh, assured me that if I tried to use my phone to, to video this face, it would uh, invalidate my warranty or something. So uh, the, word, the words face made for radio were part of the conversation. So uh, a so very, very brief introduction. I'm delighted to be with you. I, I am Dave Roberts. I'm on the faculty at Kino Flagler Business School, just up the road, uh, and I teach sales. And I'm uh, really proud to, to do that. I've been at the school now for 10 years, and we are one of the very few schools to, to teach sales. Uh, so plugging, uh, plugging the, the school, uh, which is something I'm very proud to do. I think the numbers are actually depressing. I mean, this is great to be talking to a sales audience. Uh, but there are, I think, 4,531 tertiary education establishments in North America, 4,531. The number that teach sales at any level is 55 out of 4,500. The number that teach at the master's level, as we do, is 15. And I get it. You know, I, I know sales is what lots of people think is what bad people do to good, innocent people. You know, I, 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 understand, I understand that. Uh, but really delighted to, to do what I do. Um, I've been here, I'd say, 10 years, and this is my first and probably only academic placement. Uh, my background is uh, as a practitioner. Um, originally, many moons ago, I was an electronic engineer. And that was my first job, which I hated. And uh, in the early 80s, I joined what was a phenomenal company that was looking for engineers to train the salespeople, and that was Hewlett Packard. And so I joined HP at the perfect time. I got to meet Bill and Dave, and, and uh, I, if you've ever spent time with, with Hewlett Packard in those days, you know how good they were at developing leadership. So I, I had a great 11 years with HP. Um, and then left HP to um, join a very small consulting company. There were four of us when we started. And over the next 16 years, we grew it to just under 100 million and sold it to a big software company called Siebel, which some of you might have heard of. And so that's what brought me over to the States. So the year 2000, I bring my wife, my two little girls, kicking and screaming from London to Atlanta, Georgia. And, and that was a culture shock. I can tell you. So, and I found myself VP of uh, product development with Siebel. And one of the first questions that Tom Siebel asked me to uh, answer was, how do you get salespeople to use CRM? So we're not going to do that this afternoon because we don't have long enough. But, uh, <laughs> but if people are interested offline, I'm happy to talk to you about what we discovered. What I thought I'd do this afternoon uh, would talk about something else that appears to be facing many companies, which is the problem of trying to get an accurate forecast. And so I, did, I didn't really didn't know what to call this session. Uh, my first one was in search of the Holy Grail, because I sometimes think that it's a bit like the Holy Grail. It's, uh, and sometimes it's like watching Monty Python's version of it, uh, seeing companies trying to get an accurate forecast. Uh, or is an accurate sales forecast a myth was another, another thought I had for the afternoon. I mean, is it real or is it, is it something imaginary? Um, or another one I had was this. Um, I really thought of calling this, uh, section, this session the butchering art, uh, doctors, you're killing your patients. And the reason we're choosing this, I want to take you back in time. I want to take you to a place called Leeds in the United Kingdom, and I want to take you to the year 73. That's 1873, not 1973. And there's a big conference, a bit like this, only, only bigger. And in Leeds, they brought all the, the premier surgeons of the time together in one room. And surgeons were doing their best to, to work on patients and to save lives. And they studied for years, and they considered themselves to be very professional and very dedicated, and they did what they thought was right. And of course, what they didn't realize was that they were killing their patients. And at this, uh, at this uh, conference, a young upstart, a young guy, I mean, he wasn't very old, I think he graduated with his medical degree aged 26, but a young guy stood up and basically had to fight against the tide. And he had to say, I mean, at the time it was gentlemen, but I tried to make this a little bit more more gender neutral, but he had to say, doctors, you are killing your patients. And this man, of course, was a man called Lister. And what was happening was surgeons were doing their very best and trying to get better each year at doing their very best, but it was having a negative effect on the outcome. And the reason why I think this applies to forecasting is I think we're doing exactly the same. I think this is what companies seem to be doing. We're, we're sometimes repeating the process. We're automating the process. Um, I'll show you in a moment what we're doing. We're adding math and science to the process, and it's really not changing anything. In fact, it's getting worse. In many places, we're still killing the patient. The patient, in this case, being, of course, this thing called the forecast. So I just want to share with you, in, in the brief time, we've got some ideas. I hope, I hope you take away maybe one or two golden nuggets um, that might help you with forecasting. But I'll tell you, I'll, I'll preview the big one. The big one is stop trying to forecast in the way that you are, because the majority of companies 
are going about it wrong. And I will say, and I feel a bit like Lister here, I think we're killing the patient. Uh, so I'm going to try and suggest some alternative ways to do it. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, I thought it would be worthwhile talking about why, why do we forecast? I'm sure it's different for, for every company, but, but you know, reason number one I hear from companies is um, I need to be able to make management decisions. So I need to know how we're going to do because I need to know what resources I'm going to need. You know, do, can I recruit more salespeople? Can we um, have marketing programs? Can we develop new products? So, so that's reason number one. Reason number two very often is, um, especially if you're a publicly traded company, I need to tell the street because you typically have CEO or CFO every quarter have to predict accurately what they think they're going to do the next quarter or by the year end. And if you lie about that, you go to prison. Okay? And if you mess up, people just go, hey, it's sales. So that's what they're doing their best. So that's reason number two. And of course, reason number three is if you're manufacturing stuff, sometimes you want to anticipate production. So you want to use the number to help you with MRP. And you know, these are the three big reasons. And if you keep going, you keep going, then you get to reason number 42, <laughs> or somewhere, because it's actually helpful for the salesperson. And here's issue number one, is that the people that we're relying on are getting the least value out of the process, typically. And so what we're doing is we're relying on input from people that get very little value. In fact, what I'll show you is they get the opposite. Sometimes by, by exposing and by sharing and by telling the truth, they get the very thing they don't want. And so that gets in the way of them doing what we need them to do. So, so one of the problems is this. We're relying on a source that's getting very little value from the process. So we'll just sort of file that one away for the moment, and, and, and we'll come back to that. Okay. Now let's just make sure we understand what forecasting uh, is about. So when people talk about forecasts, and there are lots of ways to think about it, I, I think in general this is what people want. They say, I want it to be accurate. In other words, if somebody says they're going to make these numbers, that I think they're going to make these numbers. And I'd like that to be accurate at the individual level, and I'd like it to, to bubble up to the organizational level, because we're going to make big decisions on this. So I want accuracy. Um, I want good data. You know, sometimes, and especially when times are good, you might get the right number, but from, not from the right places. Have you ever had, had that? So it all sort of works out, but it's not from the places you thought it was going to come from. So it's not what you call quality data. Um, want to do it with minimal time and effort, and here's an issue, because what lots of companies seem to be doing is putting more energy and effort into it. That's taking salespeople away from their selling time, but the result isn't improving. So how can we do this with minimal time and effort? Otherwise, it gets in the way. Because people say, hey, what do you want me to do? It's like with CRM, isn't it? They say, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to fill out the form, or do you want me to sell? They say, well, actually, it's the same. But that's an interesting thing to have a conversation with people about. Um, and you want to maximize, call it maximize sales effectiveness. You want to make sure that everybody is understanding what's going on, so your company's going in the right direction. I heard this afternoon some really good presentations about you know, what it takes to start up a company and how you need to have alignment of your people. And, and so we don't make sure everybody's going in the same direction. So there's a lot at stake here around this thing called forecasting. And of course, what we know around uh, forecasting, again, I'm not, I'm not going to do this to death, but just to make sure we're talking about the same thing. Forecasting is basically predicting what comes out of the pipeline at a certain point in time. I mean, that's all we're talking about. It's saying to people, you've got this complicated sales funnel, and I don't know what it is for the businesses in this room, but it could be anything from days to weeks to months, or some of you might be even involved in average sales cycles of years. So you've got this big black hole of the pipeline, and what you'd like to know is, when is something actually going to come out and become a deal? Because that's when we can count it, and that's when we can spend the income, and that's, and that's when we can do something good with it. And so that's what we're talking about is forecast, is say, I'd like to know this number at the right time. It's as straightforward as that. All right, so, so that's the concept, that's the setup. So let's talk about what companies are doing then. Um, so I just want to talk about three forecasting methods and then suggest why you don't do any of these. Really. Okay, so um, the most used is a forecasting method called DSF. In fact, there, there are probably people in this room that, does anybody use DSF, the forecasting method? There'll be probably so many, I'm sure some of the companies use it. You might not call it DSF. In fact, you probably don't call it DSF, because I just made that name up. 
<laughs> but I just want to say, sometimes people go, yes, we use it. You know? <laughs> yes, we are ardent supporters of DSF. We've used it for years. All right, DSF. I didn't catch anybody this afternoon. DSF is doctors use forecasting. Um, it is honest. It is the it's the most used approach. Doctors use forecasting is all about fiction. Doctors use forecasting is when you say to your salespeople, what's your forecast? And you take the answers that they give you and you add your own fiction and roll it all up and it ultimately comes to a number. That's doctors use forecasting. And historically has been the most used forecasting method. And of course it's a problem. It's something called weighing the pig because basically what we say to salespeople is how heavy is the pig? And they say the pig's 250 pounds. And they go, mm-mm, needs to be heavier. <laughs> and they go, no, it's 250 pounds. No, needs to be heavier. And they go, 280, that's better. <laughs> so, so what we do when we ask the salespeople and apply all this pressure to them about the number, we, they're weighing the pig. It's very emotional. We're adding a lot of emotional pressure to them. It's very subjective because one person is 250 pound pig is somebody else's 320 pound pig. I mean, they don't know. They've just got wet fingers in the air as well. So it's very, very subjective. This can work when times are good because the law of averages works for you. But one of the interesting things that's happened since 08 is when the economy did this, what you suddenly find is all the stuff that we got away with, we don't get away with as easily anymore. We actually need to be better at what we do. That's why I actually like downturns in the economy. I know it's a pain in the butt, but I really quite like it because it means that we have to be better. So this can work when times are good because law of averages work, but overall, it's a bit of a risk. And then, of course, what happens is the manager writes his own fiction on top of it. Because if I've got a team, this is my team, you know, I'll talk to somebody, say, what's your number, and give you my, give me his, Stuart will give me his number. I know Stuart is a sandbagger, so I have to add because he hasn't told me everything. I talk to Sheila, and Sheila, of course, is the optimist, and I have to half Sheila's forecast, and I do that. I add my fiction, and I cut it off, and my boss knows the same about me. And so he has his fiction or her fiction, and on it goes. And, and so what you end up with is a very interesting Dr. Seuss story. So that's not good, is it? And I hope, I hope you progress beyond that. Am I correct, or, or are there still people in this room who maybe are using Ask the Sales People? Anybody willing to share that? Anybody? No, I'll tell you. All right. And we use Excel spreadsheets, and, and then we add language like, what's your commit, and what's your... Right, so let's go, uh -uh, let's, let's kill Doctors Use Forecasting. So what companies do is they say, I know what we'll do, we'll add science and math. Okay, because this will make it more accurate. And so what they do is they add science and math in the form of this thing called percentage likelihood. All right, so now of course it's all going to work out. Because I can apply, I can do pivot tables on this. I can do percentage probability. So, so I do percentage likely. And so you've got things like deal number one is that value, likelihood is, therefore expected value is, and I add it all up and I get my number and I either feel good or I don't feel good. But it feels a lot better because there's science, there's math. And actually, this is not any better. This is just doctor's use has done a science degree fiction. <laughs> it's really all that's going on. And of course, the big, the big thing about this is, it's rare that there is 20% of a deal. I mean, I've never seen one. <laughs> I've never been paid on 20% of a deal. I either won the deal or I lost the deal. So, so you can feel better about this. But the problem now is this. So we've still got a question on percentage likely, because one person might view something as 30% likely and somebody else views it as 60% likely. And, I mean, who's to say? Really. But it sounds good because it's got a number. Uh, then, of course, there's a visible range. And one of the interesting things for salespeople is they won't share stuff if you're going to do bad things to them, if they tell you. <laughs> so some people will hide stuff. It's like Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. So they choose what they share. It's called the visible range. They choose. And you know the thing they hate the most? Why they don't share big deals, especially with management? Because we want to help. They say, what can we do to help? Which really means, what can we do to bring it in sooner? And that's no good. So, so the, and then, of course, you've got team inconsistencies. You've got differences from people to people, from teams to teams. Um, I can opt in or opt out. I don't have to tell you everything. Okay? If I went to lower level, 10%, 20%, 30%, I'll choose not to tell you. I'd rather wait until it's more certain. Because if I raise it and then it goes away, you're on my case, and I don't want that. And then the final thing is update practices. 
What rules are there to move these percentages? Why should I tell you that it's only gone from 40% to 50% or 60%? And who the heck knows anyway? But it feels better, because we've got math. People go, oh, that's obviously no good. So let's do more, let's do more. I know what we'll do, we'll add technology, <laughs> okay? So let's have some process. I mean, this is the big one now, is the sales process. We'll have some sales process, we'll have some technology, we'll have stages, okay? I'll go and buy CRM, and in fact, some CRMs I buy, and remember, I worked for Siebel for a long time, so I understand this stuff. And you get these stages, and then you go, well, that's it, that's all I need. I throw a tool at it, and I get this panacea answer. Of course you don't. As a friend of mine once told me, a fool with a tool is still a fool. I mean, all you've done, all you've done is automate inaccurate information. But it feels better, because now I've spent all this money on technology, and I've got tables and colors, and I've, and I've got graphs. Now, theoretically, of course, what I should be able to do is very sensible. What I should be able to do is, if I've got common sales stages, and you know what I mean by sales stages, whether you've got a five-stage, six-stage, seven-stage sales process, I, I sort of know what qualification is, and I know what um, communication of value is, and I know, you know, we've got common sales stages, so in theory, I ought to be able to do a consolidated view across my business. I mean, this is theoretical. If people are playing the game correctly, I could get a consolidated view, and I could theoretically assess funnel balance and risk. Like, for example, if this is what I've got for my company, I know what's going on, or think I do. You know, if this is what I'm seeing is that I've got volume late stages, and I've got nothing going on in early stages, it probably said marketing's not doing a very good job. Yeah, that's what it could say. You know, we're going to have this gap because obviously stuff has to come in at the front end of the funnel, then I'm going to have a gap as it moves through, and hopefully if we close all this business, I'm going to have a really good next quarter. That's what I think. Or, or, could it say this? Could it mean there's a whole lot of stuff that people don't want to tell me about? You see, now I've got a tool that makes it look as if I know what's going on, but doesn't actually do that. Or what about this one? You know, I get pipeline pattern number two, and I look at this and I think, oh, okay, well, look at this. This is obviously marketing's not doing a lot, sales are doing all the generation, and they, but I've got a big drop off here. We wonder what's happening between stage there and stage there. You know, that would be useful information if I could believe it. And then, of course, this one is pipeline pattern number three, is the one you very often get, which is no, nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, just about to close this big one. So the theory's good. But I tell you that just throwing technology at it, just throwing math at it, is not going to fix it. And this is what many others are doing, thinking that the solution is going to fix the problem. And in and of itself, it won't. I'm not saying, by the way, that all of these are nonsensical. You do have to talk to the sales force, and you do have to think about probabilities, and you do have to think about common sales stages. But you have to do a whole lot more. And this is really what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon, is that our common feel, our view of what happens in the sales process as we move through these stages and how probability goes up, here's where there is a fatal flaw. So here, here we go. The, the problem is this. The problem with using the systems that most of us use is still we're leaving it to the salesperson to do subjective stage evaluation. We still leave it to them to say which stage they're at, mostly. Okay? Salespeople we know don't, either don't want to or don't use the technology. Okay? I mean, they mostly don't. And it's not their fault, by the way. When I first joined Siebel, I had to go and meet with very many uh, SVPs, and they say to me, I'm surprised our people aren't using the CRM. I mean, they look at me, they say, I'm really surprised we spent, with Siebel, I mean, two and a half, three million dollars, we spent all this money, and I'm surprised they're not using it. And I had to look them in the eyes and say, I'm surprised you're surprised. <laughs> and they go, why? I said, well, you bought it for the wrong reasons. What did, why did you buy it? And they said, well, we want standardization, and we want to make sure we've got all the information in the organization. And I said, well, that's the problem. You didn't buy it for them. You bought it for you. And this is at the heart of the forecasting problem. We're doing it for us, we're not doing it for them. So we have to stop killing the patient. Otherwise, we're gonna keep suffering with this. They're gonna do subjective stuff, they're gonna invent fiction through the use of a tool now. I mean, it's like giving doctors use an early word processor, basically, okay? Still a fiction, but now automated. And there's a fundamental problem with this anyway, that, I mean, who actually believes the percentages go up as you move closer to the end? 
One millisecond before your customer is going to buy from your competition. One millisecond before they buy from your competition. That's the end of the sales cycle. What's your probability of winning the deal? Zero percent. There, there. All right, so that dispels that one. Stuff doesn't just go up the closer you get to the, to the end of the process. So, so we're basing a lot of our, our, our theory and a lot of dependency on, on the wrong things. So the problem is, and this is where I'm now going to say managers, I think we're killing the forecast. I think most of what we do is having a negative effect on the forecast because what we're doing is focusing on the sellers. And the problem is this, that the sellers, that the value to them of being honest is not big enough. In fact, the opposite. The more honest they are, the more pressure they get, the riskier it is. So that's not good. Too much visibility means they get too much heat. We're holding their feet to the fire. They get help from us, or so they believe, in closing deals. And that's, that really isn't what a professional sales job is about. Okay? And so what they, gain, what they do is they gain the system, or they choose not to play. And we might not even know it. It's like, I know some companies that pay their salespeople to use, our, say, they use their CRM system. I mean, they pay them. Well, sure, if you want junk in the boxes, then pay people to fill out the boxes. If you want them to use it, you need to motivate them in a different way. So that's where I want to finish this afternoon, is talk about how, how you motivate them. See, what you have to do is find the answer to the question, where's the value for the user? And I would suggest to you that salespeople, and there are many in this room, but I would suggest to you, my interactions with lots of salespeople over the years, they're fundamentally interested in three things. It boils down to this three. Okay, so this is like the ROI. Number one, can you help me find new business? Can this thing, whatever you want me to do, can it help me find new business? Number two, can it help me win the business that I'm pursuing faster and with a bigger average set? And number three, can it get my boss off my back? And if you try and get salespeople to use something, if you can answer one of the, all, all three of those, you've got a winner. If what you're trying to do doesn't answer those, you have a loser. Because what they'll do is game it or avoid it or, or do whatever they need to survive. Because salespeople are clever people, that's why we employ them. And they're cunning, and they're agile, and they're flexible, and they're reactive. And, and the weird thing is, we want them to be all of that outside, but we don't want them to be that when they come back home. You know, we just want them to follow the process, and well, that doesn't work. So what we've got to do, I think, is change. We have to find ROI for the sales force. And so what it boils down to is this, and this is the blasphemy piece. This is stop killing your patients. So this is like saying don't operate. What I'm saying is, so stop forecasting. The job of manager shouldn't be to forecast, the job of manager should be to manage deals and help your salespeople manage deals because if you do this, you get a free forecast. So stop thinking about forecasting, start thinking about what the real job is and the real job is adding value to the salesperson and you get this thing, I call it forecasting for free. And that would be good. So let's not think about forecasting as a separate overlay meta process, it's just the outcome from doing the job. So what do I mean by managing deals? Well, now if I focus on helping salespeople win business, the value to them is greater than the cost. I'm going to help them close the right deals at the right time. The salespeople are going to use the system to help improve their effectiveness, because if it does have value, this is what they're going to do. And so what we do is we get rid of the problems. So just to finish off, and then there'll be a couple of minutes for questions. So things that we see, these are the most common bad practices. And I don't want this to be a contagious manic depression session. I, I hope that you're not looking at this going, oh, no, that's us. But this is just common, common bad practices. Things like uh, that people focus too much on the sales process and don't give a hoot about the buying process. You know, people spend all this time, energy, and effort on the sales process. That's irrelevant. It's not where you are. It's where the buyer is. That's the thing that tells you how long stuff's going to take. And that's the thing that tells you what you're going to close, is where's the buyer? So we need to focus on the buyer process. This determining sales stage by sales activity, what the salespeople are doing, is irrelevant. It's not what they're doing, it's what the buyer's doing. That really is the important thing. And I think if you look at, and there's a whole concept of customer evidence gates around buyers that I think could be useful. Uh, this whole concept that the percentage probability increases with sales stage, not true. I mean, it can do. But it doesn't always. There's a bit of a correlation, but it's not 100% correlation. And it all depends on how well you're doing. Do you have competitive advantage? Do you have competitive disadvantage? Are you a parity? That changes that. So let's not assume percentage increase with sales day. And then, of course, forecasting based on expended value, based on, on this probability. And then the big thing is this. 
the salesman's behavior. We're the worst. We're the surgeons killing the right behavior. So we're causing it. We deserve very often all the inaccurate forecasts that we get. So what about forecasting for free? Because you know, I feel over here, this is, this is like the forecast and then, you know, and then a miracle happens. This is, well, here's a miracle. So here's all you have to do, people, if you want, a, if you want an accurate forecast. So first, first of all, focus on value for the set first. Most forecasting processes are not valuable to them. And I'm not talking about just give them a little bonus if they get their forecast right. It has to be bigger than that. Real value. Find more business, win more business, get the boss off their back. That's value for a salesperson. What else can you do? Use the sales process to map to the buying process. The key. Very often we don't understand our buyer's buying processes. We're just getting our handle on the sales process. We need to understand the buyer's buying process. Um, wherever possible, use an opportunity management methodology because your job as management should be to help the salespeople improve the probability of winning a piece of business. And the only real way to do that is to use some opportunity management process. And it almost doesn't matter which one. I mean, they've all got their advantages, they've all got their disadvantages. I know I used to work for a company that invented one of them. Uh, we used to compete with several. They're all good. Just pick one. Pick one and use it. A sales methodology is what I mean by that is a process for helping win business. Okay? An objective process. And then use customer evidence. This is the key thing. Look at where the buyer is. That tells you how long things have got left to run. I've seen salespeople say, I'm in the final stage of this deal, and you discover that the buyer has got, they haven't, they haven't socialized the, the solution. They haven't explored the possibility of it with anybody yet. So your last stage might take months. And the only way to understand this is to, is to look at customer evidence. And then the, the, the final piece I have for you, and it is one of the previous presentations, I mean, it's really interesting how all these come together. This cultural thing, it is about culture. It is about sales culture. If people feel that they're under pressure to invent a number, to weigh the pig and give you a number, they will. So you have to take that pressure away from them. You have to get them focused on what their real job is, which is winning and progressing deals. And your job as management is to help them, help them do that. And it's very different. It's a very, a very different, uh, a very different culture. Um, so you know, my notion is if I start off with uh, with with Lister's original work, which he called the butchering art. Now let's think about this thing called surgical precision. So it is fixable, but you have to change the culture. There was a time when surgeons used to be proud of the mess on their apron yeah. because that reflected competence and that reflected experience. And nobody knew that all the gunk was the thing that was killing their patients. And so just imagine, if this was Leeds, 1873, you'd be all there going, he's insane. We're doing our best. He's insane. And what I'm saying to you is it's stop forecasting and you'll get a forecast. The more you focus on trying to get the forecast right, the worse it's going to be because we're really good at making it bad. <coughs> so that's, that's what I have for you. And I, I don't know if we have uh, time for a couple of questions this, this afternoon. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, sir. What's the best way to categorize those opportunities? sort of abstract, so. Yeah, it is. Um, so it depends what sort of business you are in. It's going to be very different from a transactional to a consultative business. Um, some pe sometimes people say, how many sales processes do I need? You know, can I have one for, for the everything, or do I need one per product we sell? For the, you need a sales process, I think, defined for each of your key markets. So if there's a different buying process, you need a different selling process. If, so one sales process for each of the buying processes. That, that sale process should map onto the buying stages of, of the buyer. So there's a long-winded answer to your question, which is, you know, so first question you need to understand is, where are you in that process? So two questions, really. The first question is, where am I? The second question I suggested, as the second piece which most people don't to ask is, how well am I doing? That, those two, the combination of those two things help you determine what do I need to do and how long is it going to take. So where am I, and how well am I doing? And how well am I doing, I'm thinking primarily from a, from a competitive perspective. So and you can even just do three versions of that, advantage, parity, disadvantage. But the combination of those two determines what needs to happen and how long it's going to take, typically. So it's a big question. So when you look at most companies um, that we've all worked with, um, the company itself, if I, if I work for a large company, I have a sales stage. A lot of most companies have sales stages where you have to deal. Yeah. So I think vernacular here when I look at it is that there's sales stages, but as a sales rep, when you go out, my thought is you 
should have a sales process to yourself because by the, just like those doctors, by the time they leave, you gotta make sure as the rep that you're asking all the questions to find out how they do buy. Yeah. And then align your behavior towards how they buy. Of course, great reps have the ability of expediting that and getting to the right levels much yeah. faster. But by the time you're leaving, like, okay, so clear next steps, where do we go? If the stars and the moon align, like what I said earlier, yeah. you know, when you want to go live. So you might have your own sales process. Yeah. But my company has sales stages yeah. you have to put a forecast. Yeah. Two different things, correct? Correct, yeah. And I think, uh, so to fix forecasting, you need sales methodology which is to do with the stages and progressing through the stages. Now, your salespeople also, in order to accelerate through those stages, need to have this thing which you might think of as a sales process. Um, and there are various, various versions of that. You could do, you know, some people talk, we heard spin selling earlier on. Right. That, that, that borders on being a, a, a mini sales process. Right. You can look at the, um, what else would there be? You can look at um, uh, the company in, in Charlotte, SPIs, pain points. You know, the, you look at consultative, consulti well, fourth or fourth, as it, as it previously was, yeah. SPR. You can look at consultative self, Mac Hammond's work. Yeah. You can look at, um, what's, the, what's the thing that came out of the CB in? Uh, Challenger. Challenger. Challenger self. You see, they're all processes that sit on top of the stages. So the first thing is to determine where are you from a scientific perspective based on where the buyer is, and then, the process is, how do you move quickly through those things? So, you know, it's all sounding a bit esoteric now, but maybe the way to think about it is this. Your sales stages should, should accelerate the buyer's buying process, and your sales process should move you through your sales stages. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's, that's maybe a, a way yeah. to think about it. I'll say, can you say that again? Can you say it again? <laughs> <laughs> I might be using it. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. So your sales stages are... You, the, the application of that, it should be to accelerate the buyer's process. And then sales process should be, and you use sales methodology to assess where you are. And then sales process should be to accelerate the movement through your sales stages. The sales stages accelerate the buyer stages, and the sales process accelerates your movement through the sales process. Sales stages. Yeah, see, I couldn't do it twice. Yeah, yeah. you have it? I'll have to try right, one back. last question. Anyone else? Oh, Somebody at the back. For the bigger companies that they have a lot of levels, how would somebody who's a sales rep or a sales manager first year maybe be able to see the tail wagging the dog when they're being told they yeah. have Yeah. Yeah. Senior management, bless them. I mean, they, <laughs> they love these. They're so destructive um, very often. Um, I and mean, it, it's tough. I mean, if we wait for it to come down from the top, then we die. Uh, it's, it's probably not going to happen. I always look at, you know, I mean, I'm probably, I probably am the oldest person in this room, I'm guessing. Uh, so, so, which makes me feel really sad. Uh, but I, you know, I've, I've been through, I started selling for HP in 81, so what's that, 30, 36, 37 years ago. And you know, at the time, you looked at who were the sales managers, first and second level sales managers, and what they were used to. And now you look at where they are in the echelons of companies. And the problem is they've taken some of that 80s and 90s thinking into the new millennium. Because some of this stuff used to work. It used to be fine. A lot of this stuff was, was OK. Um, just like, frankly, the old closing techniques, you know, the, the Ben Franklin close, the alternative close, the puppy dog close, all the stuff people used to use, that was fine. But the world has changed people. And very often it's the senior management, they haven't. And so they're still, they're still stuck a little bit in this old way of thinking and, you know, they're, they're measuring activity levels. And, you know, they, they hear words like, let's get back to basics. They say, yeah, well, as long as basics doesn't mean 1980 basics, because the world's moved on. So that, that's an issue. I don't know that that's an answer other than don't get frustrated and keep fighting. And I think sometimes you just have to do stuff at your level. You know, because if you, I think if we wait, it's not going to happen. So we have to, I think it's bottom up, and hopefully we'll get top down. But if they're not getting the right numbers now, then maybe there's a motivation to change. Dave Roberts, thank you very much. Thank you very much.